Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to today's briefing. I am joined once again by interpreter Margie Prop, and thank you so much, Margie, for providing your services and joining us this, this morning. Thank you all to tuning in. To say that we are living in unprecedented and challenging times is an understatement. In addition to navigating the pandemic of COVID-19 that surfaced late last year, we are now being called upon urgently to confront and address the longstanding pandemic of racism and inequality in our society. Over the past several weeks, I have heard from many people in our community, including young people involved in peaceful protests, business executives, African American faith leaders, other elected officials, local university professors and administrators, our police officers, Lincoln Public School scholars, diversity and inclusion professionals, national experts in community policing relations, and of course, concerned residents. I have heard from people with different stories, perspectives, and experiences of life in Lincoln. And I've heard from people with vastly different viewpoints and opinions. I am struck by the courage displayed by many of our residents and public servants to be vulnerable in the face of those with whom they disagree to humanize in the face of dehumanization. It's so difficult to do that. It's much easier to preach to the choir than it is to bridge across traditional divides. And it is much easier to hold one story or narrative than it is to hold multiple stories or narratives at the same time. I approach this moment with humility, recognizing that I have much to learn and unlearn and many stories to hear and understand. I also recognize that I do not have all of the answers and that I am only part of the solutions since we all have a part to play in creating a more just and inclusive society. In that spirit, there are two stories I want to address briefly today. First, I will touch on the story of our Lincoln Police Department and some of the positive work our officers have done in our community to build good and enduring relationships. And then I will touch on the story of persistent systemic racism in our community, which has contributed to a culture in which many of our residents do not feel safe and included here in Lincoln. Our city's community policing model prioritizes developing relationships and building trust between law enforcement and the residents they serve. Our officers live, work, raise their children, and enjoy our city as residents first. Well, they have a special responsibility as law enforcement professionals to serve and protect the well-being of others. They approach this responsibility as a collaboration with their fellow residents. Part of our officers' duties, for example, include regularly attending neighborhood association meetings to understand concerns across our city. In the last 12 months alone, even with the impacts of COVID-19 on city operations, our police officers spent almost 1,000 hours participating in community events and making presentations to community members, reaching an estimated 26,000 people in Lincoln. Of note, LPD organizes a local chapter of a national summer program called Marathon Kids to promote fitness and fun activities based out of the F Street Rec Center. And it's our understanding that we are the only police department run chapter in the country to have gained sponsorship from Nike. In addition, LPD's Five geographic teams enable officers who comprise them to become more grounded in the community, getting to know apartment managers, residents, neighbors, and children who play at local rec centers. I vividly recall a ride along I went on with an officer from the center team who could greet community members on O Street by their first names. From pop with a cop to heroes and helpers, to high school career fairs, to participating in fundraisers for Voices of Hope, which provides crisis support for victims of domestic violence, our police officers are engaging in community, community events every day and not asking for credit or recognition. In this manner, they support and benefit the community in ways that are often not visible to the broader public, but they are deeply felt by those who are directly impacted. 
Beyond these events and special collaborations, the Lincoln Police Department partners extensively with organizations throughout the community, recognizing that our officers are called upon to respond to residents with a wide variety of needs and that the police also have a significant role to play in keeping people out of the criminal justice system. LPD's REAL program, a decades-long partnership with the Mental Health Association of Nebraska, has enabled LPD to refer over 1,000 individuals for mental health services, reducing crisis calls and the number of community members who are taken into emergency protective custody. Then there's Project Restore, a collaborative program that successfully diverts 11 to 17-year-olds from entering the justice system by instead providing appropriate social service interventions and referrals. Lancaster County Human Services Department Director Sarah Hoyle and our Chief of Lincoln Police, Jeff Blymeister, have been invited to speak at national conferences about this program, which is a recognized national model. These efforts and many others on a daily basis by LPD are a big part of why our officers proudly put on a uniform and why, as mayor, I am proud of the work that they do to fulfill their oath to serve and protect. But this is not the only story to be told. There is another story, one rooted in hundreds of years of black people in America being seen and treated as less than human, in policing and beyond, that is crying out to be heard, acknowledged, and acted upon. In my conversations with black residents and other community members of color, I have heard clearly that they do not experience life in our city in the same ways that our white residents do. Often, they do not feel safe, and they do not feel free from the exhausting anxiety that accompanies a life lived in constant concern for one's own security and that of loved ones. I have heard how they look at that horrifying video of George Floyd's last breaths and see the potential for that to be their brother, their father, their son, or even themselves. In recent days, I have heard countless references to the talk that black parents have with their children, a talk that robs their children of precious and defining qualities of childhood, innocence, joy, optimism, and trust. And while our Lincoln police have worked hard to form deep relationships with so many in our community, these feelings of distrust still persist. Many of these feelings of distrust are rooted in experiences of police surveillance that our black community members do not see happening to white community members with the same frequency or even at all. I recently heard from a black pastor who, while driving his minivan, noticed in his rearview mirror that a police officer was running his plates, despite the fact that he was not speeding and his vehicle had no visible problems. I also heard from a black undergraduate about the time he was walking home from class at dusk and was approached and asked where he was headed, not once but twice, by two different police officers. The numerous stories and lived experiences of people such as this local pastor and student do not align with the statistics showing that Lincoln is not as bad as other cities in terms of racial discrimination or with the Nebraska nice culture that we often like to tout. How difficult it is to listen to these two stories and hold them both at once to try to reconcile what feel like competing narratives. In these profoundly polarized times, how easy it can be to instead pick a side. Yet what I encourage our community to do is to resist the idea that there are sides to be taken. We are being called upon to acknowledge and address uncomfortable and painful truths about what it means to be black in America. This is not the time to pick a side, but rather to form a circle. One that brings people with different life experiences together to see and hear their truths and to find ways to co-create solutions to the problems being illuminated. If this sounds improbable or even impossible, then let me relay another story I have watched unfold in recent weeks. As I sat in the grass at a peaceful protest, listening to young leaders call for change, a high school student named Alexandra took hold of the megaphone and told the crowd how Lincoln could be the model for the rest of the country of how we move forward to a better, more just future. Then, last week at LPD headquarters, as I was having a discussion with officers at the beginning of their shift, 
I listened to an officer named Max, who was sitting at a table in the back of the room. He raised his hand and said the exact same thing. In the midst of the anguish that both Alexander and Max feel right now, and for vastly different reasons, their capacity to envision our community emerge from this pivotal moment as an example for the rest of the nation to follow gives me hope. We must build on that vision and we must do it in concert with one another. We must work toward realizing the vision of a community where people of every race and every story feel a sense of true belonging. Everyone has a part to play in this work. We create transformed, inclusive new realities by becoming transformed, inclusive people. This is about the resident as well as the public servant, the private as well as the public sector. It means me, it means our government and our police department, and it means you. It means cultural change as well as policy and institutional change. It means both doing better and being better. One area in which our Lincoln Police Department continually strives to do and be better is in the area of use of force or use of control. Each year, our police department conducts a review of its use of force policy. This year, in response to community member concerns and in the spirit of continuous improvement, our police department has undertaken a mid-year expedited review of the current use of force policy. This review has already been informed by hundreds and hundreds of emails the city has received from constituents calling for specific changes to our use of force policy. And it is also being informed by the Citizen Police Advisory Board. The Citizen Police Advisory Board is a seven member body made up of Lincoln residents appointed by the mayor and first established in 1976. It's believed to be one of the oldest Citizen Police Advisory Boards in the country. The board reviews complaints regarding police procedures and policies and makes recommendations to the mayor, city council, and chief of police based on their findings. On June 30th, LPD will share with the public its proposed revisions to General Order 1510, which is the police department's use of force policy. The revisions will include a codification of sound de-escalation strategies, practices intended to minimize the use of deadly force and the use of neck restraints, more comprehensive reporting, and a more robust duty to intervene. At that point, the public will have an opportunity to provide comments on the proposed revisions. And in July, at a date that will be set by the Citizens Police Advisory Board tomorrow, that board will review the proposed revisions to General Order 1510, along with the public feedback. The CPAB will then draft a report with final recommendations. And the process for providing public comment on the proposed revisions will be announced on June 30th. LPD embraces this opportunity to clarify and strengthen their policies in order to build deeper trust with our community. LPD wants to be part of the solution that ensures that everyone in our community feels safe and secure in the knowledge that Lincoln is a place where people are firmly committed to building a more just and equitable world that recognizes the full humanity and dignity of every individual. We're committed to moving in the direction of the world that Alexander and, Mark and Max envisioned, one built on true justice, love, and peace. And finally, this morning, we have some news to share regarding the redevelopment of an iconic block of downtown Lincoln. In March of this year, we reported receipt of a response to the open invitation for redevelopment proposals for the Pershing Center block. The deadline for additional submissions was May 11th, and at that point, we released details of those proposals to the public and conducted an internal review and interview process with all of the proposers. And today, I am pleased to announce the selection of White Lotus Group of Omaha to redevelop the downtown block bounded by Centennial Mall, 16th, M, and N Streets. The developer proposes to build a 100-unit affordable housing apartment complex along with a wellness center, childcare facility, commons area and green space, retail and underground parking. The project as proposed represents an investment of approximately $54 million, including the use of tax increment financing and low-income housing tax credits. 
In addition, the proposal designates a location for a public library along Centennial Mall and M Streets if the community supports moving forward at that location. The proposed project includes over 300,000 square feet of new improvements. As we developed the 2018 Downtown Master Plan, we saw Pershing as an opportunity for a visionary catalyst project that would benefit the entire area. And although a great deal of work remains to be done, this exciting news for our community and is and it takes us one step closer to a new chapter for this historic block. Here to provide some additional details is our Director of Urban Development, Dan Marvin, and Assistant Director, Dallas McGee. I invite you up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I always tell people my fondest memory or first time I ever went to Pershing was when I went to a Bachman Turner Overdrive concert and I was 15 years old. Um, so I have a lot of fond memories and I think that it's great that we're getting this property repurposed. Um, with me today is Stalis McGee. I think he'll go through some of the history of what has happened since probably roughly about 2010 when we undertook the building of the uh, Pinnacle Bank Arena. Um, the Pershing served as a place where my kids could go through graduation, and I think it's fitting that we're going to be seeing the Pinnacle Bank Arena open up um, for graduations here shortly. So we've repurposed in a great new facility, but we've had trouble and difficulty getting a developer to, to commit on this particular block. But as Mayor said, we will get a 100-unit um, affordable housing project. We'll get a wellness center built in that area, uh, child care facilities, a coffee shop, and an, a vision of really trying to create activity over on really an iconic street, um, Centennial Mall. So uh, we're expecting that this will be a, a, a fantastic development. The process that we used for this was we got a response to an IFRP that was on our website. Um, we had five proposals. Those proposals were reviewed by a citizens group of uh, people within the city government and outside, and it was a unanimous decision. The White Lotus Group was our unanimous choice by that panel that was convened and listened to all of the different developers' uh, proposals and reviewed countless amounts of material. So we're confident that we have a great um, developer and I'd like to introduce Dallas McKee who's been here for a number of years and can kind of go through the history of how we got to this point. Dallas? Thank you Dan. Um, we all have history with Pershing, and we all have personal stories going back many, many years. I, too, have, have gone to numerous events in Pershing Auditorium. And we've talked about reusing Pershing for a long time. Uh, our first invitation for redevelopment proposals was, was back in 2012, eight years ago. We issued an a, uh, RF, IFRP and received three proposals. The proposals were evaluated by a selection committee, and the recommendation was at that time to not proceed with those proposals because they didn't capture the vision, the potential that, that we felt this block deserves. So over the years, we've seen other, uh, other proposals come in, other people talk to us about various ideas, and in 2018, I brought a uh, the downtown master plan, which the mayor referred to, and which we use on just about every decision, large and small, with respect to downtown. This master plan identifies several catalyst projects for downtown, projects that would make other things happen. And the first of those was the redevelopment of Pershing. It identified five potential uses and said we should actively look to pursue what would be realistic in terms of redeveloping this, this iconic property. Um, as the mayor said, we received uh, five proposals. They were very good proposals. We selected, we recommended to the mayor, uh, White Lotus. It's, they're based in Omaha. They've done numerous things. 
uh, in this part of the country, uh, particularly in Omaha, but they haven't developed yet in Lincoln. So we're looking forward to bringing them to Lincoln and working with them uh, developing this block. I think what they're proposing is very appropriate for downtown. It certainly addresses a, a need in this community for affordable housing, and they'll be combining that with uses that complement affordable housing. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Dallas and Dan. And yes, with that, we would like to open things up for questions from the media. Are there questions? You're having trouble unmuting, I think. You can also contact Diane Gonzalez if you're having trouble. All right. Can, can you hear me, Mayor? Yes. Uh, Bill Kelly from NAT. Are, with the Police Advisory Board, are there recommendations that you're putting forward uh, from what you've heard from citizens? The policy revisions are informed by uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, recommendations coming from constituents. So yes, there has been that taken into consideration. It's also, you know, LPD's intent to clarify policies that exist already and best practices that we can, you know, codify in order to provide the reassurance that LPD is very committed to ensuring the safety of all our residents. This, again, process is something they undertake every year, but we are expediting it and bringing a new um, set of community input to the process so that we can try to be as responsive and engaged and uh, provide meaningful uh, revisions to policy that update our current practices and, uh, and clarify them and make them more robust. To clarify my question, are there recommendations that, that you're specifically putting forward and feel that need consideration? I am involved in the process and my team has been working with the chief and the police department uh, to examine the different um, specific policies that have been recommended, but this is, of course, an expertise in policing operations that needs to be reviewed um, by folks who are intimately familiar with the practices of the Lincoln Police Department. And we are all taking this very seriously. Um, it is a collaboration. Mayor, Andrew Ozaki from KETV Omaha. I was Thank wondering, you. as you as you reviewed the, um, I guess the the videos and and looked at the reports from the way your officers handled the protests and the demonstrations, was there anything that you saw that was troubling? Uh, I, well, public safety and allowing for peaceful gatherings is our goal. And so when that didn't occur on certain nights, when there was folks who were physically injured, both law enforcement officers and people who had gathered, when people um, who infiltrated those gatherings and brought things to be hurtful, to take away from the peaceful message of the vast majority of protesters, of course we were disappointed. Of course that's not, I don't think anyone was happy with some of the, what we saw on those nights. Uh, we quickly evolved and adapted to try to create enhanced conditions for peaceful expression of important calls for social justice and equality. And so I think you saw uh, a rapidly evolving situation move in a direction that everyone felt better about. And as a follow-up, I, I guess, what about the use of, of rubber bullets uh, of, of the, um, I guess, the dogs, which, which seem to, I guess, uh, um, kind of reinforce some of the, um, I guess, the, the, the concerns that other citizens have about firing on the public? What... One thing that I learned over the course of that week was how the mere presence of people in riot gear 
uh, could be taken as visual and visually antagonizing and to inflame tensions. And when we um, saw that happen, we saw people then also within those, you know, a small subset of people within those crowds antagonizing officers. And that led to confrontations that none of us foresaw or wanted. And um, that, that was something we worked very hard to move away from because we want, I mean, LPD works with the public to try to facilitate gatherings and protests on a regular basis. And in this case, it was, um, you know, something that they'd never experienced before. The, the kind of destruction that we saw on, uh, at the Easy Go and on Lincoln Mall, the unprecedented um, expression of rage, Uh, led to uh, our field force using practices that they haven't had to use in recent memory. And we've learned from those experiences and evolved. And I think that everyone feels a lot better about where we are today than where we were on some of those incredibly calamitous nights. Um, rubber bullets are meant to be a non-lethal force, but as you can clearly see, they can cause harm harm that none of us want to have happen. Um, the, the attempts to try to create safe conditions got better every night. And I am pleased that we are now in a position where people can gather and uh, with the support, organizational support of the police department to allow for the free expression of their concerns. Um, that is where we always wanted to be. We have a question from Lori Pilger. On the police policy revisions coming, is anything being considered that would make the process of police disciplinary actions public? Uh, I'll, I'll let the chief take that question because um, General Order 1510 is more about use of control or force techniques, but I'll let the police chief take that. Those are definitely part of the contemplations and discussions that are going forward, Lori. Um, currently, there are collective bargaining clauses that uh, are very explicit in nature. And while we do report publicly surmised data regarding use of control, regarding discipline, um, and there is publicly available um, information regarding the terminations, the most extreme type of circumstances or resignation in lieu of termination that was based upon a uh, implementation and statute. All of those things are part of the discussion and some of it exists today. There are other questions from the media? Mayor, Andrew Ozaki from KTV again, I guess. Uh, what's your feeling about, you know, the term defunding um, your police department and putting maybe some of those funds towards some of those other programs or strengthening some of those other programs in which you talked about? Okay, well, uh, that phrase defunding the police is being uh, tossed around and it means a lot of different things to different people. I think the the spirit of that is to make sure that there are appropriate responses to the needs in our community. That if there, and we've seen escalating calls for mental health services in Lincoln, which is why the Lincoln Police Department is taking on the full cost of a, of a partnership with the Mental Health Association in this budget. Um, They're doubling their financial support for that because they value that that program uh, it's how they make sure that people who are experiencing mental health crises are referred appropriately to social service, uh, behavioral and mental health service providers who can more appropriately care for them. The police don't want to take on that role. But today, the way things are structured, you know, when someone calls 911, they may very likely get a police response um, because that's who can be dispatched 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, so we will continue to look for ways to, to appropriately match calls for service with the services that accurately address them. Um, LPD wants that.
Are there other questions? All right. and, and I guess I had another question. You know, a lot of times we, you see where some of these stops do um, uh, result in, um, you know, crimes being prevented or people being arrested for crimes that they have committed. And I, and I guess, you know, um, what's the difference between, you know, maybe good police work and profiling? I'll bring back up to, to tackle that question for you, Andrew. Andrew, good question, one that's been posed uh, many times prior to the uh, current events and ones that you and I, I think, have personally discussed. And any action, any enforcement action that is taken explicitly based upon the race, the gender, the uh, sexual orientation, the religious affiliation is wrong, it's against the mission and values, and that is not an appropriate uh, tactic by any means. Uh, you're right, there are crimes that are prevented day in and day out based upon traffic stops that are being conducted by Lincoln police officers and law enforcement professionals across the country. Whether that's the distribution of large quantities of narcotics, whether it is the removal of guns, stolen guns from the street, whether it is based upon focused deterrence on individuals we believe are responsible for violence within our community, those are tools that are being used. Those tools are not based in any foundational concept on the race or the other things that I have mentioned of an individual. So there, for me, is that clear delineation. Hi, Chief. Bill Kelly from NET, just real quickly. Um, Heading into this process, are there areas of police policy and procedure that you feel are in need of update or review uh, that you'd like to see discussed in general? And then as, as Andrew pointed out earlier, uh, is there any consideration or is it important to review the use of, of uh, non-lethal force weaponry? Great questions, Mr. Kelly. And one, do I believe that there are revisions that uh, are fundamental and can improve the practices that we provide? So by reassuring, so for um, explicitly codifying information in our policies, um, giving that guidance to our officers, to the public, and then incorporating that into our training those are things and there, there are suggestions that I do have and those suggestions will be brought forward to the Citizens Police Advisory Board who then, based upon what the mayor has described, will have an opportunity for public comment on those. You specifically mention um, our intercession into incidents that evolved from peaceful protests to criminal acts of violence and property destruction and our response to that. And one of these is the less than lethal um, munitions. So I wanna just today what the guidance is and has been. Those are focused on acts of aggression that are occurring to other members of the, of the crowd that are they're peacefully protesting or acts of aggression to our officers or in response to damage. But I agree, there, this is never, these are tactics that have either never been or very, very rarely employed within our community. And in fact, I look back to the events as they began to transpire and when the property destruction and the violence, the arsons that started at Easy Go, I was in disbelief, Bill. And I still am today when I speak about this out loud, that this was happening in our community. And so there is an opportunity going forward for us to reevaluate the strategies that we employed. Were they right? Were they wrong? Were they somewhere in between? And how can we do better? Because we are focused on that, and that directive came in the initial days 
following that to our staff. So revisions to those particular policies and practices and training is something that we're evaluating. In fact, we're evaluating again this morning and we'll continue to do so because we need to meet the expectations of those in Lincoln while fulfilling the mission of the Lincoln Police and law enforcement professionals across the country. Are there any uh, remaining questions from the media? Purging. Well, obviously, um, we value libraries in our community because they are important doorways to future success. We know that children who learn how to read and are school ready by the time they um, you know, approach kindergarten have a much better chance of graduating from high school or be becoming people who can find successful employment opportunities. We know that our libraries are safe places for kids to go after school who may not have other places that are quiet to do their homework. We know that libraries offer access to digital technology that connects people with the broader world and allows them to pursue jobs, to update their resumes, and to identify new opportunities for themselves and their families. We know that libraries are much more than just buildings with books. So as a community, in order to build a new central library, we will of course have to have a commitment uh, to making an investment. Um, the subject of the central library has been one of, of ongoing conversation. We do believe there is a lot of support for it, but ultimately that would be something that our community would have to cast votes for in order to provide the kinds of resources necessary. But what's great about this project in this proposal is that in creating an opportunity for that to be part of a partnership, we think it has an even better chance of being supported by our community. This is a mixed use development and that sounds like wonky planner language, but what it really means is that the library is being uh, proposed in conjunction with other really valued functions in our community, functions that allow people to gather in a cafe, that allow people to be housed at an affordable price, that allow for more parking in our downtown area. And by being an important part of that mix, uh, we think that this could very well be the site for the library. And we look forward to having that conversation with our community and trying to have the kind of successful project as envisioned by the White Lotus Group. Any other questions? Mayor? Yes. Mayor, yes. Andrew Ozaki from Channel 7 again. Is there, is there any consideration about possibly dropping any of the charges against some of the protesters, especially for curfew violations? And I guess on the other side of that, what would be, I guess, the argument about not to do that? I have publicly indicated that we are reviewing our options in terms of potentially providing pardons for those who were peacefully uh, protesting. We know that, uh, for instance, on the night, the second night of curfew, that you know there was an adult trying to get people home and away from Target who ended up being arrested. And perhaps that is something, uh, if that person wants to apply for a pardon, perhaps we should consider doing that. Um, the flip side, because there are, of course, different perspectives on this, it's not an easy subject, is that there are lots of folks who were abiding by the curfew. Um, but what we want to do is to be able to move forward. What we want to be able to do is to have the opportunity for all our community members to succeed. And if there are those who are being peaceful um, and were caught in the melee um, and now have a mark on their record that might hinder their future success, we are, we are looking at how we might be able to identify those individuals. It may not be easy to do that. I don't have an update for you on that subject, but since you asked the question, I'm doing my best to answer it. Other questions? Other questions? All, right. All right, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to this briefing. We appreciate your continued interest in the growth of our community and the movement forward towards a more just and equitable community. And we'll be back again later this week. Thank you.